So one week uh, into the year 2023, and I guess for most of us, this week will be the first normal week of the year. Now many have made, I'm sure, New Year's resolutions. Uh, I've made a few. Um, but for me, it's always quite amusing uh, to see the New Year's resolution runners uh, running in the streets. Um, you can see them from a mile away. Um, they normally look very awkward uh, running. Um, they've got uh, this brand new shining shoes um, and, and uh, everything, and they're running. Um, and I always wonder if I will see them in the next few months, if they will still be going. Now, with school starting uh, and no more upcoming bank holidays, um, we are, I think we are all getting back to our normal routines. And many of us are looking forward uh, to 2023, but I think for most of us, 2023 is also a year with a lot of uncertainty. I mean, when we look uh, forward at the year to come, we just don't know how the situation will unfold in so many fronts. I mean, take political, for example. Many wonder how many prime ministers are we going to have this year? And then on an economical front, Many wonder what will happen to the whole cost of living crisis and what will happen with inflation. Will it improve or will it get worse? And even within an international context, many will wonder what will happen with the war in Ukraine. Will it escalate or will some solution be found? And then for rugby fans like myself, it's also a big year because it's World Cup again. And many are wondering who will win this year. Will the Springboks do it again? Or will it be France or New Zealand? Or will the new coach of England work miracles? We don't know. For many Christians living in the UK, uh, this year can also seem a bit daunting. I read an article the other day which branded Christianity is now officially a minority religion. And to be quite honest, it becomes harder and harder for Christians to shine a gospel light within this secular world. So as we look ahead to the year 2023, and as we have to face so many uncertainties, I found this psalm in Psalm 11 really helpful, um, and I, I hope it will be helpful for all of us as we study it. So I decided to take a break from Ephesians. We'll be back in Paul's letter to the Ephesians next uh, uh, opportunity I get to preach, but... Let's work our way through Psalm 11. So if you have your Bibles, please have it open. Um, I will uh, start from the uh, top and work our way slowly to the bottom. Now our first heading, I will give them to you as we get to them. The first heading that we have is a hostile world. A hostile world. We see that this is a Psalm of David. Um, it's directed to the chief musician, as many psalms are. Uh, so David was, uh, wrote the psalm, and they used to sing it as a congregation together. And in the first verse, we see uh, David basically giving the whole theme of the psalm. He says, in the Lord I put my trust. And as we'll see for uh, this year in 2023, that should be our theme as well. That in the Lord we put our trust. Now other translations uh, translate uh, it uh, a bit more helpfully. Um, the ESV says, in the Lord I take refuge. And that's really a wonderful way to put that, in the Lord I take refuge. Now why did David say that? What, what situation um, led David to actually say these words? And he answers it immediately. So he says, how can you say to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain? Now here we see there was a group of advisors that you, that uh, in the Hebrew is plural. So there was a group of advisors, David being king, he probably had many advisors. They advised him to flee, to flee as a bird. They said, David, what you are doing is so, uh, where we are is so dangerous you need to flee. You need to run away. Now, we don't know exactly uh, under which circumstances David wrote this psalm. But as we study the life of King David in the Bible, we see that he indeed had many times where he had to run away. 
or where he was tempted to run away. Just think of uh, David already being anointed as king, but yet the, the current king at the time, King Saul, so many times pursued him and wanted to kill him. And later on in his life, he had Absalom also trying to overthrow him and kill him as well. So we know that David had many enemies, and he was uh, uh, regularly, I'm sure, advised and tempted to flee. So in verse 2, it tells us exactly what the trouble was. It says, the, the group of advisors says, look, look. And then we are introduced to a group of people called the wicked. The wicked. Now that group, we, we see that quite regularly in the Psalms. There's a group called the wicked. And they are directly opposed to, uh, to God and his purposes. They try to overthrow David as being the righteous king and to all the others, as we see later, those upright in heart. And that's the second group uh, that we will meet as well. So uh, 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 the second group is called the righteous. So we have this tension between these two groups, the wicked on the one side and the righteous on the other, or those upright in heart. Now, in verse 2, uh, this group are portrayed as being archers, having arrows in their bows, ready to shoot and kill, not just David, but all his followers. And this group said, these are so dangerous that they can shoot and kill any time. Now, at the time when the psalm was written, there was nothing unusual when you went to war uh, uh, to have archers attack you. You were normally quite prepared to face uh, many arrows coming your way when you went to attack the enemy. But the big thing to notice here, it's not normal warfare. This is not normal warfare. These archers are portrayed as hired assassins. It's like an ambush. Look, it says there, second part of verse 2, that they may shoot secretly at the upright in heart, or it can be translated that they shoot in the dark. In other words, they were lurking in the dark, in corners. You, you were not able to, to identify, oh, there's the enemy, let's go and attack them. They were hiding. They were, they were in the dark. You, you don't know how many there are, you don't know who they are, and you don't know when one of these archers uh, can shoot and kill. Now you may uh, ask, so if David is the righteous king, why are these assassin archers allowed to lurk in the dark and waiting? Why are they allowed? Why is nobody doing anything to stop them? Or even worse, why are these archers even helped and supported? And this is answered in verse 3. It says, if the foundations are destroyed, if the foundations are destroyed. Now, what's meant by that statement refers to the moral fabric of society. It says that society is so degenerated, they've departed so far from God and from His laws, that the foundations are indeed destroyed. In other words, right is no more right, and wrong is no more wrong. And this is referring specifically to a de departure from the Ten Commandments. There is no more appreciation of or reverence to God's law within society. And here we see it's not just David who's in danger, but all those who follow him, those upright in heart. Those who are God-fearing believers, they are also in danger to be attacked and killed. So David indeed lived in a very hostile world. And it was so also with our Lord Jesus when he came to this earth. And it is no different for us as well. I mean, when we just look at God's Ten Commandments and we compare that to the society that we live in today, we can see that as well. For example, how many times do we hear people or, or see on the television or radio of God's name being used in vain? 
a direct breaking of the third commandment. What about Sundays? Uh, that's supposed to be a rest day and a day for worship. Sundays are used uh, nowadays for fun and sport activities. There's no more worship of God. We see that the whole family structure is under attack where children are openly allowed to be disobedient to their parents and they are not disciplined or discipline is completely neglected. That's the direct uh, contravention of the fifth commandment. And so I can continue. What about abortion, assisted suicide, euthanasia, and all of that that contravenes the sixth commandment? We know the whole situation with uh, sex and sexuality and how that contravenes the seventh commandment. And so we can go through each of these commandments, but they are really symptoms of society not regarding the very first commandment, and that is to worship our, Lord, our God and Him only. So that is uh, 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 the situation David found himself in, and it's even the situation that we found ourselves in as well. And then a very natural response would be to ask the question that we see here in verse 3. It says there, what can the righteous do? What can the righteous do? The, the question like, what difference does it make if I live out my Christian uh, faith within this dark society? What difference can I make? Isn't it better to just hide away? Is it worth it at all? And Maybe as we look forward to the new year, Maybe some of us also feel the same as David did. Maybe we also feel, is it really worth it to still be a Christian in 2023 with all this um, going around us, living in this hostile world? Now, there are many ways that Christians can be tempted to hide away from God. Let me mention a few. The first one is, to neglect to mention that you are a Christian to others. To rather stay silent, to be a Christian undercover, and avoiding the topic at all costs. That's a way of hiding, isn't it? Never to mention to your colleagues, um, uh, especially when a situation arises that, uh, that you have an opportunity to do so, but never to, to mention that you are a Christian and that you are following God. Or to never talk about your faith in front of others, in front of uh, uh, unsafe family members and friends, to never ever talk about your faith, or to never share the gospel with anyone. Or maybe even when the church has an outreach, um, when we go to the square or we do, we do an outreach together, to find a good excuse not to be there, <laughs> because you're worried that you might run into somebody familiar uh, in the square. Now, as David was looking around him and saw this very hostile world, David can certainly be forgiven to be tempted to follow the advice he was given and to go and to hide away. But this brings us to our second heading, and that is that David then looked up. Instead of around him, he looked up to God, and he, uh, he, he was looking at God to see who God is. And that, so our second heading is a sovereign God, a sovereign God. So David now declares, and it's quite possible that this was David's response to these um, advisors. He declares some very vital truths about God, which can bring us hope within our own situation. So before we get into the, the, these truths, there's a very important application, I think, for all of us. We are also, as Christians, in need to remind ourselves about great biblical truths of who God is. And that, a different word for that is theology. These truths are not just boring and dry truths. They are vital truths that we need to apply to our hearts to remind us of the Lord we are serving, of the God we are serving, and what He is like. So which are these truths that David uh, refers to? So I've broken them up in a few. And the first one is that the Lord is present. The Lord is present. He's present with us. Look there in the first part of verse 4. It says, The Lord is in His holy temple. 
Now, at the time when this psalm was written, there was a, a, a temple. Uh, uh, um, before the big temple was built, there was a, a, a temple of worship in Jerusalem. And the, lo the Lord or God was in His holy temple. He was manifest. His presence was manifest in the holiest of holies. Fast forward all the way to the New Testament. We now see that through Jesus, God is with us. I mean, one of Jesus' name was called Emmanuel, God with us. But the Bible also teaches us that God is with His people living in their hearts. Being really near, present, as we are temple, the temple of the Lord, we ourselves. So we learn that through God's presence then with His people, God is present with us today. That means when we have to face um, the enemy, when we have to face those, uh, the wicked or those opposed to God and His purposes, we have the Lord's presence right with us. The Lord is not far away, far removed. And the Lord didn't say, you, you go on um, and, and you faint for yourselves on earth. No, God is with us. He is present amongst us. And that must be a really great comforting truth about God to remember in times of great difficulty. God is with us. The second very important one um, is mentioned where David says the Lord's throne is in heaven. And that means the Lord reigns. The Lord reigns. We know that the Lord is king and His throne is in heaven. Even though God is present with us, God also reigns from heaven. His throne is far above this world and all the evil in this world. He is high above it. He is sovereign. The wicked cannot influence him or even attack him because God is high and lifted up. He rules from heaven. And it is so important that we have both these truths and we hold them together. Both that the Lord is present with us and also that the Lord reigns from heaven. And this is, uh, uh, was David's important view of God. Both God's imminence, His presence with us, but also His transcendence that He rules from above. The third important truth that uh, David used to comfort him was that the Lord sees. The Lord sees. Look there in the second part of verse 4. It says, His eyes behold, His eyelids test the sons of men. In other words, the Lord knows where the weak, all the wicked is hiding. In fact, the wicked are in His hands as well. We cannot see the, uh, the wicked and all their evil schemes against us, but God can, because God sees. He sees everything. Nothing catches Him by surprise. Therefore, we don't have to be afraid of the wicked and all the schemes of the wicked, because our God is in control. He sees absolutely everything. And this should really be our hope for this year in 2023. We cannot see ahead um, of all the days coming in, in 2023, but we know that the Lord can. He can see even in the future. So that is, the third one is that the Lord sees. Next one is in verses 5 and 6. It says there, The Lord tests the righteous, but the wicked and the one who loves violence, his soul hates. And that is the Lord judges. The Lord judges. Now look at the strong language David uses. There's no that, uh, nothing about God um, hating the sin but loving the sinner. It says, the Lord hates the wicked. He hates them. Um, it says his soul hates, hates those who love violence and the wicked. His soul hates. This means that God is directly opposed to the wicked who conspire against him, who are his enemies. And then um, uh, David uses a picture that, that should be familiar with us. He says, upon the wicked, in verse 6, he will rain coals, fire, and brimstone, and a burning wind. That must remind us of what happened in Sodom and Gomorrah in uh, Genesis chapter 19. 
Here David says that in the same way as God judged that evil city, God will also judge the wicked. For those who are enemies of God, the judgment of God is certain. And this will obviously happen, the Bible teaches us, when, uh, when Christ returns one day, and all the wicked, those who, who are his enemies, those who never trusted in the Lord Jesus, will be sent to hell together with Satan and his fallen angels. And this truth should be very daunting for all of us. Because the Bible teaches us that all of us were not born on the side of the righteous or the upright in, in art, but rather we are all born as wicked, as those opposed to God. A few verses from Romans 3 is quite helpful, and I'll read, um, I'll just read, you don't have to, um, to page there, but Romans 3 verse 9, um, Paul says, What then? Are we better than they? If we can apply that to our text, uh, we can uh, say, are the righteous better than the wicked? And then Paul, Paul answers, he says, not at all. For we have previously charged both Jews and Greeks, it means everybody universal, everybody, that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good. No, not one. And this makes us realize that as God will judge the wicked one day, we all deserve God's judgment. We were all born as sinners. We have all broken God's laws. We have all come under the judgment of God. And then we see a very interesting phrase. Um, if you look at uh, verse 6, the last bit of verse 6, it says that this terrible judgment, it says, shall be the portion of their cup. Now those of us who know the New Testament well must take us to the Garden of Gethsemane when our Lord Jesus was there praying and then asking the Lord to do what? I will read it to you uh, in, in uh, Mark's Gospel. Uh, chapter 14 from verse 35, it says, uh, Jesus went a little farther and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. And then he prayed this, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. Here we understand that that cup that Jesus was referring to, was referring to God's judgment on a sinful world. Jesus, our righteous king, stood under God's judgment in our place by drinking the cup of God's judgment on our behalf. When Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus as a human being was tempted, just like David, to flee. But yet Jesus submitted to his Father's will and he took that cup that was destined for us. He took it and he drank that cup of God's judgment. The next one we see uh, in verse 7 is, The Lord is righteous. The Lord is righteous. Look there in verse 7. It says, For the Lord is righteous. He loves righteousness. And that is why he hates the wicked. Because God loves righteousness. God is holy. And this is why we, brothers and sisters, need a Savior. Because we are not righteous. That is why we need a Savior. And this is the wonder of the gospel message, of the good news. is that through faith in our Lord Jesus, we are seen as righteous before God. And we can not just escape God's judgment, but also experience <coughs> God's love. We can also experience God's love. So if you are not a believer tonight, or you're not sure that you are a Christian or you are a believer, I would like to ask you, who will drink the cup of God's judgment you, you deserve when you die one day? Will it be yourself? Uh, 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 do you want to drink the cup of God's judgment yourself? 
Or will you place your faith in our Lord Jesus and trust Him so that He drinks that cup of God's judgment on your behalf on the cross? The Bible teaches us that once we place our trust in Jesus for our salvation, that we are counted as righteous before God. That is why God can then love us, even though we are still sinners. Because Jesus lived the perfect life, and He suffered on the cross, He drank the cup of God's judgment. So think about that carefully this evening. The second uh, um, thing I want to say for those of us who believe in Jesus, those of us who are Christian, this psalm teaches us just how real blessed we are to have heard the gospel message, to have been given the faith to respond to the gospel, and to avoid God's judgment, to escape God's judgment by having Christ do that for us. And this must really give us the confidence to live our Christian lives in this hostile world. If we fill our minds and our hearts with the truth of who God is, like David did, just in these few verses, he mentions these, it will really help us to face um, our fears and our discouragement, uh, discouragements in this year ahead. So how can we do that? How can we remind ourselves more uh, of God's truths and apply them to our lives when we need them. Here's just a few ideas. And um, I, I'm sure there are plenty more of these. Just a few that I, I was thinking of. And the first one is to read your Bibles theologically. To read them theologically. What I mean with that is uh, when you approach a passage of Scripture, ask yourself the question and even write down the, the answer. What does this passage teach me about God? and about God's character. So many times we are familiar with certain passages and we read them, but stand still at a passage and ask yourselves, what does this passage say about who God is? What does this passage teach us? The next one is read some good theological books. And what I mean is not very highly technical uh, uh, books. They are fantastic books that's very easy to understand, but that helps us that will teach us God's character. Two of my favorites um, is Knowing God by J.I. Packer and The Holiness of God by R.C. Sproul. Very, very good books that very simply teaches us about who God is. And if you don't have, uh, have money to buy books, have you ever gone to the library of the church in the church building? There's some really good books over there as well. Go and have a look. The next idea is teach these truths to others as well, such as your children. It's important to teach your children about God and His character. As you read the Bible with them, teach them about those truths or others around you. Study together, um, husband and wife. But uh, 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 teach these truths. Uh, find a way to teach them to others. That will help you to understand them as well. And the last one is discuss these truths with those um, around you in church and glean from more experienced Christians as well. So that's the second ending, our sovereign God, our sovereign God. And then, but the psalm is not quite done yet. There's one more sentence left, the last part of verse 7, and that brings us to our third ending, is an eternal promise. An eternal promise. Now, the New King James uh, translates his, uh, as his countenance beholds the upright. But then if you look at the King James Version, it says the upright will see his face. Or the ESV says the upright shall behold his face. And both are uh, uh, possibilities within the original Hebrew. But I prefer this uh, ESV or the, or the King James Version one. The upright will see his face within the context of the psalm. And we know that both are true. But we have this wonderful promise that if we persevere in this world, even though it is so hostile, even though at many times uh, we become discouraged, this promise is one that we should cling to, that one day we as believers will behold our God face to face. 
And this speaks about when we go to heaven one day and spend an eternity with Christ in heaven, we will see our God face to face. Now Christian, as you look ahead in 2023, with all its uncertainties, let me encourage you to think about this eternal blessing, this city to come in our uh, text for the year that, we, uh, 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 that uh, David mentioned this morning. We are so quickly taken up by all the temporal things of this world that when we look ahead just for this year, we need to realize that even this year is temporal. And if the Lord spares us, this year will also pass very quickly. But eternity is forever. And that reality should be at the forefront of our minds. So as we look to the wicked, those who are opposed to Christ and to His kingdom, we realize that our Lord Jesus taught us to love our enemies and to pray for them. We are commanded to reach out to this dark world, to this dark and hostile world around us in love and courage. But with this promise at the forefront of our minds, that we will one day see our Lord face to face. So as we live in this hostile world, let's take fresh encouragement to be a shining light for the gospel. Here's some ideas, and my prayer is that as we look at this psalm, we must um, ask the Lord to give us more boldness to live out our Christian testimonies, to even take a few risks for the gospel. And here's some ideas. is Firstly, try to share the gospel with unsaved friends or family members. Maybe give out gospel tracts to others. Have some gospel tracts with you and hand them out. Or offer to read the Bible with an un unsaved friend or colleague or family member. And yes, ridicule or even persecution might be part of the deal. We may lose some friendships along the way. And we may be laughed at as well. Or we might miss a few promotions at work and things like that due to our faith. But seeing all of this, all of this suffering we may um, uh, endure in the light of eternity should give us the right perspective that what happens on this world is really insignificant compared to eternity. Now don't forget we cannot do any of this without God's help. We cannot do any of this in our own strength. We need to go back to verse 1 to say that in the Lord I put my trust. Or in the Lord, I, uh, 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 the Lord is my refuge and my strength. That is what we need. We, we need to make God our refuge if we are to succeed at any of this. So may 2023 be a year that God is indeed our refuge. So before we sing uh, together... Again, uh, the last hymn. I would just like to read the last verse um, uh, of the hymn. It's really a beautiful hymn uh, of Robert Murray McChain. Now, Robert Murray McChain, he, um, he, he, only, he was only 30 years old when he died. 30 years old. And many, uh, 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 many around the world are still following his Bible reading program, and he wrote some hymns, and, and this is one of the hymns he wrote. And then in verse 4 it says, Chosen, not for good in me, wakened up from wrath to flee, hidden in my Savior's side, by the Spirit sanctified, teach me, Lord, on earth to show, by my love, how much I owe. So let's all uh, stand together and sing. When this passing world is done, let's, let's sing together.
Let's receive uh, the benediction. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord in, in 2023, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.